Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We have a ready reception for what is offered. We're taking hold of it. We thank you that we will be hearers and doers of it as we thank you and praise you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of spiritual warfare. We've talked about how the enemy works and how we can conquer the enemy in our life. We've talked about understanding spiritual warfare and how we are to engage in it and how we can become experts in war. And we're going to talk tonight specifically about warfare intercessory prayer. And for you to engage in warfare intercessory prayer to destroy the works of the enemy in the heavenlies and over particular cities, over households, in the realm of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You and I are to be inwardly empowered. This is what the word strong means. We put the Greek words up here. But we put the cursor over them. You'll see them in the lower window for you who are here for the first time. It shows the Greek word keyed to strongs with a strongs number with the Greek word in the meaning. This particular word, endunamo, means to be empowered within. You and I are to be empowered within in the Lord and in the power. This is a different word for power. This word is kratos, which when you study it out, which we have done in the past, means a power that is being manifested and released out. In the power of his might, and the word might is his mighty force, mighty force being released out of us. Now how are we going to be inwardly empowered and then releasing the power of God with mighty force out of us? It's because of the fact that we put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The armor of God is put on through the word in you. The word in your heart, the word in your mind, the word directing your steps, the word that you're going to speak to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and the shield of faith, the word that you're going to use to smite the enemy with the sword of the spirit as you're putting your mouth into operation. It is the word of God in you, which is all aspects of the parts of the armor. And what are we going to do with the armor of God on? We are going to enter into spiritual warfare, wrestling in the spirit, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice, our warfare is not against people. Don't get your eyes on people. People are being used of the enemy. You must understand that we must come against the spirits. It is a spiritual battle against spiritual enemies. Our warfare is against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in the high heavenly places. And as we put on the whole armor of God, what are we going to do? <coughs> Verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer. This is referring to all different kinds of prayer, all manner of prayer, and supplication in the spirit. So we are going to pray with the armor of God on to release the mighty power of God with great force in order to bring forth a destruction of the works of the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Now in order to do that, we have to be in the position to do this. And Jesus Christ has brought us into that position. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says he has delivered us from the power of darkness. The word power is not the word dunamis, which means power. It's a word exousia, which actually means authority. He has delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You are now in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom is a position of ruling and reigning. In that position of ruling and reigning, you are expected to take your place and begin to rule and reign under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, the fact that he's delivered us from the authority of darkness, brought us into the kingdom, now he has given us authority. In Luke chapter 10, and verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Again, we must look up these words. The first word power is the Greek word exousia, which means authority, which we saw before. The second word for power is actually the word dunamis, which does mean power. Unfortunately, the King James has not correctly translated this. 
Young's literal translation that we always put up, which is the YLT underneath this, corrects their error. The authority is what this word means, and the second word means power. I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. You have authority over the power of the enemy, and you are expected to enter into using that authority in your position in the kingdom to rule and to reign over the enemies. In fact, we see over in Romans, in chapter 5, you and I are expected to reign in life through Jesus Christ. Verse 17 says, For if one man's, by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You and I are to reign through Jesus Christ. Now how are we going to be able to do that? It's because, again, of our standing. Not only are we brought into the kingdom, but you must understand you are a priest before God. And you have a twofold priesthood. You are a holy priest to offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Lord, but you're also a royal priest, as we see here in 1 Peter 2, 9, in the position of ruling and reigning under the Lordship of Jesus, who is the high priest of this covenant. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal, that's a ruling, reigning, kingly priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And you are to enter into ruling and reigning over all of the enemies. God has put you in that position. This is why we're told in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 33, he says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, which is what? The rule and the reign of God. You are to understand the rule and the reign of God and operate in it. And his righteousness, the way of righteousness, so you walk in right ways. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now, as you seek the kingdom, you are going to take your position with the authority delegated to you and all the weapons of warfare, and you are going to enter into ruling and reigning. In Luke 16, 16, it says this, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. That's what now has come with the time of, from John the Baptist on, the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, is preached, and every man presses into it. The word press is a word in the, in the Greek which says is, is biadzo, which is a very strong word, which means to use force and violence. You and I are going to use force and violence as we are pressing into the rule and the reign of God. Because you are dealing with evil spirits that are arrayed against you, that are trying to carry out Satan's rule, and you and I are going to come against them with the authority and the power of Jesus Christ, and we're going to destroy their works. In order to do this, we're going to enter into warfare intercession. In Matthew chapter 11, in verse 12, we see an important statement. It says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom, which is the kingdom of the book that has been preached, the kingdom, the King James says, of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. There's a mistake in the translation here, which is very important for you to understand, to understand what's being said. It is not talking about heaven singular, where God dwells. The kingdom of heaven is not suffering violence and the violent taking it by force. It's talking about the kingdom of the heavens. It is plural in the Greek. In Matthew 11:12, 12, Young's literal translation corrects this. It's important that changes the entire meaning of what is being said. And we can even show this to you in the Greek text down here. This is the Scrivener's text, which is the basis of the King James. And this happens to be one of the words for heaven. Notice that it is a noun, genitive, masculine, plural, if you see in the lower window. We also see another use of this. Oh, that's right, that's the only one in this one. It's the, that's what it is. It's, I'm sorry, I was thinking of Matthew 16 that is a plural in the Greek. So here it says that now the kingdom of the heavens suffereth violence with force and violence, the word we saw, biadzo, and the violent, the strong forceful ones, are taking it by force. The kingdom of the heavens is the rule and the reign of the heavenlies. That's where these principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and spiritual weakness have been operating under Satan's control. Who are the violent ones 
the church, believers in Jesus Christ, are the ones who are bringing violence against the rule and the reign of the heavens, against these principalities and powers. And the violent, which are the strong, forceful ones, the church, are taking it by force. This is a Greek word, harpazo, which means to seize control. You and I are to seize control of what is going on in the heavenlies. Remember that when we put our faith in operation, our faith that we have is taking aim at the things in the realm of the spirit. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, We look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. We're dealing with things in the unseen realm, the realm of the spirit. For the things that are seen are temporal. They're all subject to change. But the things that are not seen are eternal. You and I are focusing upon the things that are unseen. Now, it is important that you realize that as we pray and we intercede, that we are going to have to understand that spirits are driving people that are doing what they car carrying out their destructive work. We see this very clearly shown forth in Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, here's where the word of the Lord came unto him, and it says in verse 2, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, this was a person who was ruling over Tyrus, called a prince. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, he was a man, and not God, though thine, set thine heart is the heart of God. Many times these rulers would think that they were a God and proclaim that they were a God. But instead, he was a man. But what was operating through this particular man? Well, remember, this is a prince of Tyrus. If we come down to verse 12, he says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, A king is over a prince. Who is this king? He's the one that's ruling over this particular prince. The prince was the one who was the ruler, a man, thought he was the God, you know, but there was a king operating over him. Thus saith the Lord God, thou seest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. This is identifying who this king of Tyrus is. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Yeah, we know that that's got a bet. That can't be talking about too many people. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, bur diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. This is talking about a created being. It's an angel. And it's noticed that it was, the worship was in him, per music was in him. He was the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. And who is this talking about? Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. It's talking about Lucifer, who was the leader of the praise and worship, the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. He was upon the holy mountains. He walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was perfect in his ways from the day he was created till iniquity was found in thee. So we know who this is. This is now Satan. And of course, he was cast as profane out of the mountain of God. The covering cherub was destroyed from the midst of the stones of fire because of his sin and rebelling against God. The point that we want you to see from this is this, that there was a prince of Tyrus ruling, but there was a king of Tyrus who was really ruling over him and through him, and that was Satan. You must realize that all the people out there in the world that are ruling and carrying out their evil, evil works are there are evil spirits that are operating in them and through them. And you and I must come against these spirits. Now we can see that we are engaging in a spiritual warfare against these evil spirits. And we can see it very clearly, very clearly in the book of Daniel. Remember that Daniel, if we go back in chapter 10 to the very beginning here, in verse 1, where he understood the thing and understood a vision, and he was beginning to pray for three full weeks for revelation. He was involved in fasting and pray for th praying for three full weeks. And during this particular time, we come down here to verse 11, an angel showed up and he said, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. This is the angel speaking. 
A very important point is brought out here. Notice, he said, from the first day that he chastened his heart and you began to pray. That shows you that God hears your prayer from the very first day that you pray. At the same time, the angel did not arrive the first day. Your words were hear, heard, and I am come for thy words. What happened? 21 days had elapsed. Why was that? The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. This is an evil principality over the kingdom of Persia that withstood the angel from getting through to deliver the message to bring him the understanding that was, he was coming for his words. 21 days he was able to withstand him. Lo, Michael, and Michael was the leader of, he's the archangel over the warrior angels. One of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. That shows you that as he was praying, there was a battle going on in the realm of the spirit. Warfare will go on in the realm of the spirit as you are praying with your authority, releasing the power of God against these spirits operating in people or through them in positions of authority. And so, here, this prince of the kingdom of Persia was operating. And so, of course, he came to bring him the understanding. In fact, even he comes along here and he says, uh, he strengthened him, and then down in verse 20, he says, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, now I'll return to fight with the prince of Persia. When I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Otherwise, this is talking about the next empire that was going to come into being, which was the Grecian Empire after that. It shows you that the angels are up there and they are fighting against these spirits that are operating through Satan that are trying to bring forth evil rule and evil operations in the earth. Now you must understand that these angels that are operating through Satan are his, 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 his uh, lieutenants and and generals and servants and carrying out his destructive work. But you gotta understand that God has his host. And who are they? The angels of God. The angels of God, and they are mighty. And they will do warfare because when you are praying, you are going to see that the angels of God are going to go forth. In Psalms 103 and verse 20, speaking of the angels, it says, bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength. Actually, the word excel means they're strong and mighty. It's the word gabor, which means to be mighty in strength. And the word strength is the Hebrew word koak, which we studied before when we did the power and might series, which means manifested power. That are, have ma mighty force in manifested power that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. What do the angels do? They carry out his word. They hearken to the voice of the word. They're full of power and might, and they are going to do warfare against these evil spirits operating in the heavenlies. Now remember that Jesus, he put the angels into operation all the time. And we even see a statement made implying that and showing that he could have the angels come into operation in whatever situation he needed. In Matthew 26, verse 53, look what it says. This is when he was in the garden and he was giving himself into the hands of those ones who came to take him to the cross because it was now the time, the hour, and the power of darkness he was going to go to him and he made sin. In Matthew 26, 53, he says, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? In other words, these guys are coming after me. I can pray. The Father will send the angels. They'll deal with all the demons that are driving these people, and they'll be able to be protected. The enemy could never get to him before because he always knew what to do. He would pray and the angels would come on the scene to confront the evil spirits that were trying to work through those who were yielded to the devil. So we see the fact that when you pray, and when you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus and you pray according to his word in some aspect, the angels will go into operation and they will do warfare and they will fight in the realm of the spirit to bring forth God's purpose. Now this brings us to the point of where we need to realize that God is going to use you and me in warfare intercession. And it is important that we understand what intercession is all about. In Isaiah chapter 59, we pick up in verse 16. 
It says he saw that there was no man, he wondered that there was no intercessor. He's looking for someone, and who was the intercessor who came and accomplished his work? It was Jesus. But who's the intercessor that accomplishes his work today? It's you and I. You and I are his intercessors because we are his body now in the earth, his army. Therefore his arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness has sustained him. Verse 17. It says he put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation upon his head. That's talking about putting on the armor of God, isn't it? What did Jesus do? He put the word within him and he dealt with everything according to the word. That puts the angels in operation as they hearken to the voice of the word to deal with all the attacks of the enemy. That's exactly what you're going to do. Even when the temptations came, he said, it's written, it's written. And the angels would hearken and deal with those evil spirits that would come against him. You must understand that you are to put on the whole armor of God through the word in you, which is going to produce spiritual strength resident within you. And as you pray, you're going to release this manifested power with mighty force coming forth out of you. But notice what else he put on. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. The garments of vengeance. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. You are going to be zealous when you enter into the warfare. And you are going to be putting on garments of vengeance. God's the one who's doing this work, remember, but he's using you and I to speak forth to release his vengeance against his enemies. He says in verse 18, according to their deeds, accordingly he'll, he'll, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. Otherwise, he's going to pay back to these enemies what's due them. And he's going to bring his fury against his adversaries. How's he going to do it? He's going to do it through intercessors that are going to act upon his word. Very important. Now we need to understand this word when it talks about intercessor. I put the cursor over the word intercessor. Notice in the lower window, number 6293. It is the Hebrew word pagah. This particular Hebrew word pagah that's translated intercession has been has 46 different uses here. Of the uses, only four times is it translated intercession. It has all these other words that it's been translated of all of these different times. In fact, fall is just not just the 12 times, there's also fell, different forms of it. But we see the fact that this word has not been translated intercession, yet it's the same word for intercession, pagah. It is important that we understand what the word intercession means. How are we going to be able to do this? Well, this, their uh, uh, definitions here, and this is one problem, only one problem about this, pro this program. It is a great program, but many times they do not put the accurate meaning in there. Because what they put in there, if you notice, encounter, reach, meet, reach, and treat, make intercession, meet, light upon. Well, that's, if, if we look here, in the usage, if you noticed in the usage here, fall, meet, reach, intercession, entreat, entry, another one of the other ones is light upon. That's what it's translated in the King James Version. In other words, their meaning is not what the meaning is not what they have put. The meaning is that they have stated is the words that has been translated in the King James Version from that Hebrew word, which is that's that's not necessarily the meaning. In order to see the meaning, we're going to look at Strong's Concordance, and we're going to look at it in another program. This particular program is Lightning Bible Study, and this particular program that I have has Strong's Concordance inside of it, and you can bring up the Hebrew and the Greek words and see what they mean. This is number 6293, which is Pagah. Notice that this particular word means to impinge by accident or violence and by importunity. This is what it means. Now the word impinge, when you look up that in the dictionary, you don't look up a word until you find out what it really means in the Greek, then you want to find out what it means. A lot of people don't know what impinge means. Impinge means to strike at and to drive at something. To strike at and to drive at something. So we are going to strike at and drive at something, and we're not going to do it by accident. We're going to do it, remember, with violence. We're going to strike at and drive at the enemy with violence. Remember, we are vengeance. 
violence and force we're going to do this. And by importunity, importunity we means with persistency. In other words, you and I are going to engage in striking at and driving at these evil spirits with violence, with persistence, consistent, persistent attack against these enemies. This is what the, the word paga means, and that is what you're doing when you are interceding. Now, back over here in the program, we, want, we see the fact that this word intercession has been translated many different, from, from different ways. One of the ways is this word fall, or it's also fell, and it's translated fall upon or fell upon is actually the word. And in these other translations of this Hebrew word pagah brings revelation of the intercession principles. The intercession principles that we must look at to understand what we are doing when we are interceding. Now, we see over in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 22, in verse 17. Remember, pagah means to strike at or to drive at something with violence and persistency. In 1 Samuel 22, 17, this word pagah is used in this particular passage of Scripture. Here is where the king said unto the footman that stood about him. It's used in other passages, but this is the best one that illustrates the intercession principle. And he said to them, Turn, turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. This is the one who was against those who were loyal to David. And because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me, but the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon, and what's the word? Pagah. See it below, normally translated intercede. He would not put their hands to hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. And what were they supposed to do? To slay them and to destroy them. Remember, they wanted them to slay the priests of the Lord. Well, the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon, again, Pagah, the priests. Doeg the Edomite turned and fell upon, in the past tense, same word, Pagah, the priests, and slew, which is what the, the effect of falling upon the enemy is, slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. So here we see the fact that fall upon, used in this verse, shows that when you are interceding, you are going to fall upon the enemy to his destruction, to absolutely destroy all of his works. And the intercession principle is very clear because the king was looking for someone who would be obedient to him that would carry out what he purposed, which was to fall upon his enemies to their destruction. Well, you've got to understand, Jesus is the king of kings, and he's looking for those that will be obedient to him, which is you and I. And you and I, as obedient soldiers, in engaging in warfare intercessory prayer, are going to fall upon the evil spirits in the heavenlies to their absolute destruction. And that's exactly what you're going to do in intercession. So you and I are going to be used of him to fall upon these enemies to destroy them. We see another word that Pagah is translated over in Genesis chapter 28 in verse 11. Here it's translated lighted upon. You see when I put the cursor over this, lighted upon, it's Pagah. Lighted upon, it does have the aspect of this, of this particular word, pagah, to light upon something in order to bring destruction against it. And so this means that he lighted upon a certain place. When you and I begin to intercede and begin to pray, we are going to, in the spirit, light upon the enemy in the exact place where he is, because you might be praying and say, well, how do I know I'm hitting the mark? Oh, you know you're going to hit the mark. Because when you intercede, you're going to light upon the exact place where the enemy is, and you're going to fall upon these enemies to their destruction. He lighted upon a certain place, tarried there all night, because the sun was set. This is talking, by the way, about Jacob here and Jacob's ladder when he dreamed, and the ladder here of the angels descending and descending on it. And here it comes down in verse 17, and we waked out of the sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord's in this place, and I knew it not. He didn't know that he was in the right place, but nonetheless, he lighted upon a certain place where he met God. 
And it uses the word Pagah in the fact that he lighted upon this place where he met God, and God accomplished this. Again, in the intercession principle, you and I are going to light upon the enemy, and you may not know it, but you're going to light exactly on the enemy, and you're going to hit the mark against the enemy. When you begin to intercede, the power of God is going to be released through you, and the angels of God are going to go forth, and you're going to light upon, fall upon the enemy to their absolute destruction. You are going to strike the mark against the enemy. Now, in Joshua, we see another use. In Joshua chapter 19, here the word pagah has been translated reach or reacheth. This particular chapter is tracing the boundaries of the land that was given unto the people. It talks about the borders of the land. And it talks about the border going from one place to another place to another place. It's an area that you might be reading through and you kind of maybe skip through thinking there's no revelation in here uh, about how the borders of the land are being traced from one place to another. But you've got to understand there is some revelation in it. Because it talks about the border went up toward the sea in Merilah and it reached Pagah to Dabashet and reached to the river that set before Jokunun. We see down another place in verse 22. And the coast reacheth Pagah to Tabor. And we see over in verse 26. Here, it reacheth to Carmel westward, Pagah again. And we see again, turning towards the sun's rising to Beth Dagon, and reacheth to Zebulon. Again, the word Pagah. And then we see down in verse 34 again. It turns westward here and goes forth, reacheth the Zebulon and reaches to Asher, all these places. This is talking about the establishment of the land that was given unto them. What was going to establish the land? What was going to give them the land? Warfare intercession. Because with warfare intercession, they were going to come against their enemies and they were going to drive them out of the land and see the land that God had given them be established that he had purposed for them. In like manner, you and I are going to engage in warfare intercession, and we are going to destroy and drive out the enemies so that you and I come into the possession of the land that God has given unto us. And what has he given unto us? He's given us authority. And where does our authority operate? It operates everywhere. We have authority. The name of Jesus has authority in the heavens and in the earth and under the earth. It has absolute, total authority. What are you and I supposed to do? You and I are to arise with our authority, and we are to enter into warfare in the Spirit to destroy the works of the enemy in the heavenlies and in the earth, wherever they are, and they are to be destroyed, and we are to see the kingdoms of God come into manifestation and the kingdoms of darkness be destroyed in our life. God has given us authority and power over all the enemies. And we're going to establish our land that belongs to us in your own life. You're going to establish all the promises that belongs to you in the body of Christ. We're going to take dominion and we're going to drive these enemies out of the spirit. And you've got to understand that the body of Christ in these last days is going to understand and take hold of spiritual warfare and engage in warfare and become experts in war. Because we see that in Revelation, we read the scripture this morning, but this is an important place to bring this up for a moment. Revelation 12, 7. There's going to be this coming to pass in the days down the road. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. This is a war that's going to go on in the realm of the Spirit, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out on the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This will happen when they're going to be cleaned out of the heavens. They're going to be cast down to the earth, and they're going to know that they have great wrath, knowing that they have a short time as they're being destroyed in their operations, and they're not going to be operating in the heavens any longer. This is because the church, and who's the one that releases the authority? The church. Who's God given authority to? The church. Who is supposed to engage in the warfare and speak forth this word to release the authority and be the intercessors? The church. 
Who's going to do the warfare in the realm of the spirit? The angels. And what's going to happen? There is going to be great intercession that is going to come forth out of the church in these last days to destroy the works of the enemy in the realm of the spirit. And we're going to see how this is actually going to come to pass in the spirit, whether you realize it or not, it's going to happen. God is going to use the church. We need to engage in warfare intercession because you are going to be engaging in spiritual warfare in your life, throughout your life, and in also in the, especially in these days that are coming upon us. We see the things that are happening in the world. And as we're going down these last days, it's not going to get better and better. You're going to see that it's going, that evil things are going to be progressing. Evil men are going to get waxed worse and worse. And we're going to see the evil things that are going to be happening. Now, it's important that we understand that God is looking for intercessors. Another aspect of what we do is in Ezekiel chapter 22, in verse 30. He says, I sought for a man among them, he's looking for an intercessor, that should make up the hedge, that's the hedge of protection, which is like the boundaries of the land to establish what belongs to us, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Why would, why would God's destruction or judgment come? Because of sin. Well, well how, what, what's, what's a gap? A gap is a break or a, a breach. Why is there a gap or a breach? Because of sin. It allows the enemy to operate. So, what do we do? We remit, we have authority. And remember we talked about the fact that we have authority and how you release your authority specifically. And we, through binding, through loosing, we'll be talking more about this in a moment, but also through remitting of sins. You and I can remit, sending away the sins, standing in the gap, remitting the sins of the nation, remitting the sins of people that you are interceding for. That's plugging up the gap, standing in the gap, making up the hedge that it would not be destroyed so that judgment would not come. And this is what the righteous will do. And he couldn't find anybody. So what happened? He ended up pouring out his indignation, and judgment ended up coming because he couldn't find an intercessor. Well, God's going to have his intercessors in these last days. In fact, in Ezekiel 13, verse 5, he makes a statement. He says to them, he says, you've not gone up into the gaps. Talking about the, what the intercessors are to do. Neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Notice it said you've not gone up. What happens when you pray? When you're praying, your prayers are going up in the heavenlies, in the realm of the Spirit. He said you haven't gone up into the gap where all these breaches and breaks are. You haven't made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. That is what an intercessor does. You and I are going to engage in the warfare intercession, to plug up the gaps, to build the hedge of protection. And you can build, through intercession, you can build the hedge of protection around you. You can plug up all the gaps. You can see the evil spirits be destroyed from their works against you in your life. Very important that we learn to intercede not only for our own self, but also for the things that he wants to purpose in the nation and in the world. Now, if we're going to be effective in prayer, in warfare prayer, we've got to learn that we're going to pray in two ways. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Two ways that we can pray. Praying with our understanding means we're praying with our mind, understanding what we're praying, so we're praying according to our known language. What does it mean to pray with our spirit? Well, we see the answer to that one verse back. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. When you are praying in unknown tongues, which is your spiritual prayer language, your spirit is praying. Your understanding, your mind, is unfruitful. You don't know what you're saying. Two ways we can pray, with our mind according to the word that we understand, and with our spirit according to the Holy Spirit language that comes forth out of us, which is going to be directed by God, the Holy Spirit, which is going then going to pray for things that we have no idea, we do not have understanding of it, unless he would give us interpretation of it. Now it's important that we understand that when we pray in this language uh, that this language is a spiritual prayer language that you have once you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. 
And if you don't have your spiritual prayer language in operation, you need to get that in operation. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit since you've been born again, the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. That's an important point. You receive the Holy Spirit, it comes and dwells in you, then you have the ability to pray in tongues at will. But first we're going to talk about this prayer with understanding. And we see that when we engage in warfare intercession, we're going to use the authority that we have in the position of rule and reign in the kingdom as a royal priest before God, taking our position to engage in the warfare, and we're going to be destroying the works of the enemy, driving at them and striking at them with violence and force to their destruction. Now here we see in Matthew 16, 19, it talks about two areas of how we operate in our authority. Remember, you have authority over all the power of the enemy, but how do we do, how do we put our authority into operation effectively in intercession? Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is what the King James says. Again, we have a problem because the word heaven is plural in the Greek in all three cases. Young's literal corrects the errors. Heavens, heavens, and heavens. We can also show this to you as we were showing you before in Scrivener's. Here's the first word, noun, genitive, masculine, plural, if you notice it on the screen. Here's the second word, noun, dative, masculine, plural, if you see there in the lower window. So it's plural. We look and we see the third one, here it is, noun, dative, masculine, plural. It's plural in all three cases. It should not have been translated kingdom of heaven. It should have been translated heavens. That changes everything, what it's talking about. It's not talking about the kingdom of heaven where God dwells. It's talking about the rule and the reign of the heavens where these evil principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness, and all these evil spirits have been operating and affecting people and ruling through people. He says, I give unto the keys. What are keys? Keys are means of access into something. Keys give you access into your house or be able to turn something on or open something up. He's giving you the means of access to the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of the heavens. Whatsoever thou, this is you and me, shall bind on earth. That's where you and I are. So where's the authority being released from? On earth, where you and I are. You gotta have an earth suit, a physical body, to function and operate in authority that's delegated unto you. So whatsoever you shall bind, and the word bind means to tie up, it's the Greek word deo. You are tying up in the spirit, these spirits operating in the heavenlies, it says, shall be bound in heaven. Now we have a problem here in the translation. First of all, the word, when we put the cursor, if you notice, this program's a tremendous program. I put the cursor over the, over the words and I drag it across and you see that there'll be Greek words that'll pop up. When I bring it across here, for the word be, you can see it in the lower window, it is a to be verb. This is the main verb in this particular phrase. The reason you know this is because it happens to be an indicative mood verb. You may not understand all this, but the indicative mood is the mood of reality. Now, it says that thou, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be, then the word bound is not part of this like it shall be bound, like it was a helping verb, like in English. It is a different Greek word, deo. And this particular word is not the main verb it is a participle. A participle is that which is describing something about the main verb. It's an addition to it, but it's not the main thought. It's participle. What it's literally saying is, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be, having been bound, which is the way you translate a participle, in the heavens. This is why Young's has done an outstanding job again. Whatsoever thou mayest bind upon the earth shall be having been bound in the heavens. That's literally what it says, and it's exactly right. Unfortunately, the modern translations, King James on up, none of them have translated it 
accurately whatsoever. This is why you cannot trust the translations. You've got to look them up. We've got to learn all this. We've got to know these things. Otherwise, we can just be reading things and following the traditions of men and not know the truth whatsoever. So here, it says, It shall be, having been bound in the heavens. Now, it says here, having been bound in the heavens. So who's doing this work? Is it you and I that's doing this work? No. How do we know? Because... When we look at this, it's in the passive voice. There's three voices in the Greek. The active, the middle, and the passive. The active voice means the subject, which is you and I in this situation, are acting upon something and doing the action ourselves. if it's active. That's where you shall, thou shalt bind, that's active. If it's passive, it means the subject is being acted upon by somebody else. Otherwise, the subject's not doing the action. Somebody else is doing the action. That's why it's passive. So here, when it's talking about that something, having been bound in the heavens, somebody else is doing this, not us. Who's doing it? In the spirit. The angels. The angels are going forth and doing the warfare in the realm of the spirit. And where is this happening? In the heavens. So, what we see is, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be having been bound in the heavens. This tells you something. You have authority to stop the works of the evil spirits, principalities, powers, rulers of the dark, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places from your position on earth because you have been given authority. And you must use your authority and speak forth specifically putting your authority into operation to affect some aspect of releasing that authority to affect what's going on in the heavens. This is why you're going to speak specifically. Remember that there are seven major areas of operating your authority. Binding, loosing, casting down, casting out, remitting of sins, resisting the enemy, or speaking to the mountain that we brought up. We talked about that before. Here, when we're talking about dealing with in warfare intercession in the heavenlies. We're going to bind those spirits. Now when you bind them, what happens? You are tying them up in the spirit, which means it's going to stop their operation. So I'm going to bind the spirits that are operating over our government in Washington, D.C. I'm going to bind the witchcraft spirits. I'm going to bind the New World Order spirits. I'm going to bind all these deceptive spirits. We're going to bind the lying spirits. We're going to bind all these spirits that are functioning over operating through these people up in our government and all the, these different things and it's going to stop their works in the spirit and that's where the change has to come it shall be having been bound in the heavens the angels of God go forth to perform the word whatsoever thou shalt loose now loose is the opposite it means to untie it's the Greek word luo to loose means you untie something. If I untie something, I'm going to, it used to be bound up, now I'm going to loose them or untie them from being bound. So what does this affect? Satan and his evil spirits, where they've had a particular person or place, city, whatever it might be, bound by the enemy, I'm going to untie his hold upon that person or that place or that city or wherever it is. So I'm going to do both of these. I'm going to bind the demons to stop their work and I'm going to untie their hold upon a person, place or whatever it is that I'm in operation in. To untie their hold. Very important. And again, whatsoever thou shalt loose, untie, on earth, from your position, shall be, same thing, Having been loosed, it's a participle as well. It's the exact same thing. Just show this so you see we didn't pull this out of thin air. A participle, same thing. In the heavens. Now this is important. You and I have dominion. And you've got to understand that binding and loosing are operating against the enemy. Now, some people have tried to use binding and loosing in seeing God's work be accomplished in a person's life, which has been error. I've heard ministers that have said, I'm going to bind the mind of Christ to you, and I'm going to pray that. Oh yeah, I've heard them say it. 
I bind the mind of Christ to so-and-so. You can't bind the mind of Christ to so-and-so. Binding is dealing with the enemy. It's not putting the things of God into operation. How do you get the mind of Christ? Through the Word coming into you and how your mind being renewed. Also, ministers out there have say, I'm going to loose healing to you, or I'm going to loose peace to you, or I'm going to loose deliverance to you, and all these things, thinking that they're releasing the things of God into you. And that, again, is error, and there's a lot of ministers that do this out there. Because loosing is dealing with the enemies, not with releasing the things of God. Loosing is untying something. Are the things of God bound? It's the, the Bible even says the Word of God's not bound. So we don't, have to, we don't do anything as far as loosing the things of God. Loosing deals with the evil spirits, untying their hold. It's important to say, well, how do I then put the things of God into operation? I speak them into being. Jesus would speak things into being. He would speak, peace be unto you. He would speak, be healed, be open, be made whole. He would speak things into being to release them. That's how you and I bring the things of God into being. We speak them into being by speaking and declaring what he is doing as we're releasing his word, his power. Now, another example over here about the loosing, dealing with the enemy. It's over in Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, we see over here in verse 6. This is talking about fasting, of course, coupled together with prayer. This is the fasting chapter. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? What, what does God want you to do when you fast? Not just fast and uh, not do anything else. He wants you to be engaging in prayer. To loose, untie, the bands of wickedness, that's dealing with the things of the enemy. To undo, which would be very similar to that, the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. So again, what's it dealing with? We're dealing with the enemy. We're dealing with destroying the works of the enemy. So, in using your prayer of, with your understanding, you are going to bind the spirits to tie them up. You're going to loose to untie their hold and then what else are you going to do? There's another scripture that we've looked at in Jeremiah 1, verse 10. In the heavens you have dominion. He says, Jeremiah 1, 10, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. You and I are in a position of authority. Remember, the authority we have, we're, we're far above all power, all might, all dominion, every name it's named. We're in that position of authority. And what are we going to do? We're going to root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down which are all negative effects upon the enemy, as well as to build and to plant the things of God as we speak things into being. So, God has given you authority. And what are you going to do? You're going to bind these spirits to tie them up. You're going to loose to untie their hold upon a person or place. And then you're going to speak to these spirits and you're going to root them out, pull them down, destroy them, and throw them down from their position of operation in a person uh, over, over a, a, a household, let's say, or over a city, or over a nation, or whatever it might be. Let's say we're dealing with a spirit of witchcraft, or masonry witchcraft, operating over Washington, D.C. I'm going to bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. I'm going to loose and untie its hole, and I am going to root this out. I cast you down. I throw you down. I destroy you. I pull you down from your operation over that, this, that, that capital in the name of Jesus. And you speaking that, what happens? The angels go into operation to perform the word that you have spoken. They hearken to the voice of the word. And they will confront those spirits in the heavenlies and they will perform the word of God. You see, if we haven't known this, which we haven't, most people, they don't know what they're doing when they're involved in praying for things. You are to be specific using your authority to come against these spirits and to do warfare against them to destroy their works. Now another thing that we need to realize is you have authority, another operation of authority is what about all these gaps because of all the sin? Well, you and I have authority to remit sins. In John chapter 20, 
In verse 23, it even says, Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them. You can remit, which means to send away the effect of those sins. It doesn't get the person free. It's just remitting the sins. It's plugging up the gap. We even see another example of this over in uh, Luke chapter 5, where actually in the Old Testament period, because Jesus, remember, had not been to the cross yet. Nobody could be forgiven and cleansed of their sin in the Old Testament period. It was only covered over, remember. But Jesus, in dealing with the people, he had to operate in the, New, in the Old Testament era. It says in Luke 5, 20, when he saw their faith, the faith, he said unto them, Thy sins are forgiven or are sent away, is the Greek word, aphiomi, are sent away from thee. He remitted the effects of his sins so that then he, of course, could receive healing. He remitted the sins. Now, how does this come into intercession? You and I have authority. We can remit the sins and the iniquities that a nation or a person or a household or whoever it is has allowed these evil spirits to come into their positions of authority. See, how do the evil spirits get up there and operate? Because people have let them get up there and operate through sin. Sin allows the devil not only to come into a person, but also to operate in the heavens over a particular person. They can operate over your household. They can operate over your place of work. This is another thing that's important. You need to start going into your place of business, your place of work, binding the spirits in the people and binding the spirits over that particular place of work where you go, and you will see that a change will begin to happen in the way they carry on. Instead of carrying on in all this evil stuff going on, you can, we've had tremendous testimonies over the years of people that have done this and they have seen the spiritual atmosphere change and instead of all this evil going on in this words and negative evil stuff and, and you know, evil jokes and people swearing and doing all kinds of backbiting and stuff, they began to bind all those spirits and they shut down the whole effect of what Satan was doing. It didn't get the people free, it just shut them down so it wasn't operating in that particular workplace. You have dominion and authority. You can start using your authority to take dominion in the area where you are. Start binding the spirits in the area where you live. Start binding the spirits so that you can be protected and that you will not be affected and influenced by the evil that has been going on through other people. And that's not going to change people, but that's going to stop them from, from operating against you, and you can shut down the effects of that. Very powerful of what you and I can do. Now, when we begin to enter into this warfare of binding, loosing, casting down, throwing down, rooting out, destroying these spirits in the heavenlies, remitting the sins, and so forth, we are plugging up the gaps, and we're going to see the angels go forth and do battle in the spirit against all of these uh, evil spirits and destroy their work. Now, let's go back over to 1 Corinthians 14, because... We also have the area of operating, as we see in verse uh, 15, the other type of prayer, which is praying with your spirit. If you're going to be also effective in intercession, you've got to pray in tongues. Because, do you know what all to pray for as you ought? No. In Romans chapter 8, it says in verse 26, it makes the statement, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Now, what's your infirmities? your weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for. Now, infirmities, by the way, can mean weaknesses of body or weaknesses of mind, depending upon the context. You have to look at the context to determine what it's saying. In this case, it's not talking about weaknesses of body. It's talking about weaknesses of mind, because you can see it says, for we know not, talking about in our mind, what we should pray for as we ought. So, the Holy Spirit's going to help your weaknesses in not knowing what all you should pray for. And by the way, when it says ought, this is a Greek word, die, which we've seen many times before, if you have been here, means necessary as binding, or, and it also is translated must throughout, we use the usage, must is the major word that it's translated in usage, because it means something that is necessary as binding that you must do. It is a very strong word. It says, The Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we must. Otherwise, you and I are expected to pray as we must. 
in order to be effective. He expects you to pray to get the job done. If we're not praying and getting the job done, then there must be something wrong. We don't know what all we're doing in prayer. How, what, how can we pray as we must by the Holy Spirit helping us? The Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And this is referring to that which is inarticulate speech or that which is not regular speech. And what's that talking about? Praying in tongues or some type of groaning in the Spirit in a prayer language. This is talking about the Holy Spirit intercession flowing forth through you. It talks about how the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So when you begin to pray and you begin to, in, in tongues, you are going to see that the Holy Spirit is going to be making intercession according to the will of God in line with His Word. Actually, the word the will of is not even in there. It's just italicized in the King James. I mean, it's not in there. It really means according to God, which is even stronger. I mean, it's directed by God, the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are engaging in prayer in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying through you, speaking divine secrets that you don't even know what all you're saying. But the Holy Spirit is praying effectively for you or the situation. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, He that speaks in unknown tongues speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit, you're speaking in the Spirit, he's speaking mysteries or hidden secret things that you don't know. You're under, you don't know what all you're saying. But the Holy Spirit knows this is why you need to be praying in tongues while you're also praying with your understanding. And that is very important. And also, as you engage in this, you're also going to be times when God will take you into groaning and travailing in the Spirit to bring breakthroughs and birthing of things. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, My little children of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. The word travail and birth means to experience the pains of childbirth or to travail. Now, this is a, the same word it would be for natural, but this is talking about spiritual travail. And what happens when you're involved in spiritual travail? For the women who have had children, you know when the time is for the baby to be released from the body's hold, you're going to go into travail, time for this person, this baby to be released. Well, spiritual travail is to see the person or place released from Satan's hold. It's what you are doing in the realm of the spirit when you enter into travail. And once the labor starts, uh, do you decide you're going to take a lunch break or a, or a vacation or change your mind? No. It's going to continue on until the job is done, which of course is the birth of the baby, the release of the baby from the body's hold. So when we engage in spiritual travail, you're going to continually be praying and travailing in the spirit to bring forth the birthing or the release of the person or place from Satan's hold. And you're going to continue. And when you're doing this, it's, it's going to be intense. You know, labor's intense. And as you're doing this, it's going to be intense. And also, what happens? It gets real rhythmic and steady and continuous. That's what happens in your tongues. Your tongues will get into a rhythm. It'll get into an intensity. It'll get into a pressing forth, just like in the travail, you're, you're pressing forth to deliver the baby from the body's hold. In like manner, you're going to be pressing forth in the spirit to release a person or place from Satan's hold. It's the same effect but it's in the spirit, and a lot of times you will experience the travailing in the spirit within you as you are breaking bondages in the realm of the spirit. This is also involved to birth something into being in the realm of the spirit, which is, of course, uh, releasing the things of God is also can be destroying the works of the enemy. And this will happen as you get involved in praying in tongues. And this is a, this, this just doesn't happen just like that. Usually after you've been praying in tongues for quite some time and consistently as you're destroying the works of the enemy, God will take you at the point in time into travailing in the spirit to bring a release or a, a birthing or a release of the person or place from Satan's hold. In Isaiah chapter 66, we see in verse 8, Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day or shall a nation be born at once? Of course, no. For as soon as Zion travailed, you're going to travail continually, she brought forth her children. 
there's going to be a release of something. And that's why he says, I'm going to travail again until Christ be formed in you. Galatians 4.19, he's talking about little children. And this is why we need to travail in birth, pray in tongues and travail in birth, for people to come to the place of getting established in Christ after their new births, new babes in Christ, until they get established in the ways of the Word of God. Otherwise, they need you interceding, coming against the works of the devil that are trying to stop them from advancing and growing up in the things of the Lord. Now, we need to understand that travailing and praying in tongues, groaning in the Spirit, is all going to precede things that are going to bring forth the manifestation in the natural. In uh, John chapter 11, we see down here in verse 32, Jesus is on his way to raise Lazarus from the dead. Many people think he just kind of walked up there, you know, saw what was going on and so forth, said, roll the stone away, Lazarus come forth, and that was it. No, there was a whole lot of things that were happening beforehand. We see in verse 32, when Mary was come where Jesus was, Solomon fell down his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Remember when he heard the news that Lazarus was sick, Jesus didn't just jump up and come up right away. He stay, stayed, spent some time praying before he even left. He, was, he didn't get up and just leave just like that. Because he had to win the battle in the spirit in order to see this be accomplished. You're going to have to win the battle in the spirit before you see things accomplished as well. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit. What was he doing? He was interceding in the realm of the Spirit. And then it comes up and it says, Jesus wept. Now, I've heard the people have messages, see, Jesus was full of compassion for the four poor people that had lost uh, Lazarus. That's a lying statement. It's not the truth. He wasn't in compassion whatsoever. He was involved in intercession. Why have people said that? Because they, they just assumed that his weeping was the same weeping that the Jews were carrying on and he was very compassionate. It's not the truth. How do we know? You gotta look up the words. Here's the word weeping. Look at the word below. It's the word klao, which means to mourn or to weep or lament over, would be over someone's death or loss. Same word here. Now when Jesus came and when he wept, is this the same word? No. It's a different word. Dakruo, which simply means to weep or shed tears. It's a totally different word. What is, the, what is this all about? This is talking about Jesus involved in deep intercession. How do you know? You're going to see this in a moment. First of all, notice the word 1145, and let me bring this up a little bit. It happens the usage is only used one time. Otherwise, this word dacruo is only used one time in the New Testament. Okay? But notice its origin is from number 1144, which means that is a root and it's a similar word. We're going to see, so you're going to see this number 1144, which is, of course, similar to this, referring to the same meaning in another scripture. And that is over in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. Because you've got to look up the words. You can't just assume things by just figuring that, well, he was weeping, so he must have been weeping just like the rest. No. James, Hebrews 5, 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears, 11.44, that crew comes from, which is the where 11.45 came from, Otherwise, what kind of tears was he involved in here in this verse? Tears of intercession. Strong crying and tears of intercession in prayer and supplication unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and he feared. In other words, Jesus was involved in intercession, in those tears of intercession when it says in John chapter 11, verse 35, as we see. In fact, he was groaning in the spirit. Whoops, John 11, that is. Back to that. Verse 35. Here he was involved in that. And then you even see up in verse 38, Jesus again groaning in himself. He's again groaning in the spirit. He is involved in warfare intercession all the way up to the grave when he's coming up to there. And then, after he'd won the battle in the spirit against these spirits, then he speaks, says, take away the stone. And, of course, he speaks and uh, after he says that he, how the Father had heard his prayer, he said, Lazarus, come forth. That shows you the fact that Jesus just wasn't just waltzing up there and then speaking one time. No, he was praying all along. 
He said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. He was involved in deep intercessory prayer, winning the battle in the spirit in order to see the miraculous raising from the dead come forth. This tells you something. You've got to win the battle in the spirit if you're going to see the changes come. Now, this brings us to another point. When Jesus is up there at the right hand of the Father, and he is our intercessor, it says in Romans 8, 34, speaking of Jesus, who's at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Does this mean that he automatically is making intercession for us? No. It just means he's there to make intercession for us. What is going to put his intercessory prayer in operation? When you and I pray. Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, who's coming unto God? You and I, I the Father is talking about, by him, we do everything in the name of Jesus, through Jesus our high priest, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You and I are priests. How are we going to put Jesus' operation into his high priestly ministry in operation? You and I, priests, pray. He's the high priest, takes what you and I bring. He confesses it before the Father. He confesses it before the angels. Both of those things happen. The angels are going forward to do the mighty work, and the Father's releasing the promises of God to bring them to pass in the situation to perform the Word of God. This is very important as we engage in warfare intercession. So, as you pray in tongues, you are going to see that you are going to be groaning in the Spirit, praying in tongues. Sometimes your prayer language might even change dialects. It might have more intensity, especially when it gets into the travailing stage. It will get very rhythmic. It will get very steady. It will get very intense, just like travail to release birth. It will be an intensity to bring forth a release of Satan, from, of, of the person or place from Satan's hold in order to see the work be accomplished. And that's exactly, also, you get a deep intercession where he was even involved with strong crying and tears and all these things. Deep, deep intercession was flowing forth through him. And this is going to be because you spend the time in praying in tongues. As you and I use our prayer with understanding, to bind, to lose, to remit, to cast down, throw down, root out, destroy, uh, pull down these spirits in the heavenlies, to stop all their works, whatever it might be, then and as we pray in tongues to release what the Holy Spirit would pray through us, praying as we must, praying effectively, so the Holy Spirit will flow through us to destroy the works of the enemy, the angels going into operation, and you're going to be groaning, travailing, you're going to be speaking things that you don't know what all to pray for because you and I don't know every situation. But the Holy Spirit knows everything, and so when you begin to pray, combining your praying in tongues with your praying with understanding, you're going to be effective. And you're going to be falling upon the enemy, striking at, driving at, with force and violence to their destruction. To bring lighting upon the enemy is a mark to be reached in the realm of the Spirit, even though you don't see where they are, but you're going to hit the mark against them, and you are going to drive them out. You're going to see the boundaries of the land that God's given to you, the promises of God. You're going to clean house on what is affecting you. You're going to stop the works of the enemy, and you're going to make up the hedge for protection, and you're going to plug up the gaps as you are engaging in warfare intercession to the destruction of the works of the enemy in the realm of the Spirit. Amen. Warfare, intercessory prayer, you and I must engage in it. In fact, we'll just close with one last scripture over in Colossians chapter 4. Here's a guy who understood what he needed to be doing. Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always, this is his lifestyle, laboring fervently, and the word laboring fervently is the Greek word agonizomai. We've seen this before. It means to contend with the adversary. Same word translated fight in 1 Timothy 6.12, fighting the good fight of faith. Talking about here, always contending with the adversary for you in prayers. All different kinds of prayers. Prayer with our understanding, prayer of binding, prayer of loosing, prayer of casting down, throwing down, rooting out, what a prayer of remitting of sins, whatever type of prayer needed to be done, prayer of speaking to the mountain for it to be removed. You have dominion, as well as praying in tongues. For what? 
that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. If we, the body of Christ, will arise and begin to pray effective warfare intercessory prayer with our understanding and with our spirit, we will see God accomplish all that he purposes. And we're going to see that we're always going to, we're going to come to the place of standing complete, perfect, complete in all the will of God as we're hearing and doing his word. God wants to raise you up to be a mighty warfare intercessor. We need to be involved in praying. You've got to know you have authority. You've got to operate in authority. You've got to know your weapons. You've got to be speaking in line with the word. You've got to be understanding that when you speak, things shall be in the realm of the spirit, having been bound or having been loosed by these evil spirits, from, by the angels dealing with these evil spirits, and you're striking at, driving at, falling upon them to their destruction. And that's exactly what we're doing when we're engaging in warfare intercession, wrestling against the principalities, powers, rulers of the dark, the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And as you pray with all manner of prayer, as well as you pray other things, you're going to pray specific prayers for specific promises to come to the past and revelation, all different kinds of things for people and their needs to release what God's purposes are in their life. Then you're going to see great effectiveness. But because we haven't done this, this is why the church has not seen what God purposes. It's because you and I must engage in warfare intercession. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that brings revelation of intercessory prayer. I understand that I'm to strike at and to drive at the enemy with force and violence, with persistence to their destruction. I'm going to light upon the enemy in the spirit. I'm going to fall upon them, and I'm going to cast them down, throw them down, root them out, destroy their works. I'm going to stop them as I bind, and I'm going to untie their hold as I loose, and I'm going to take dominion. And as I pray with my understanding and with my spirit, releasing what the Holy Spirit would say, interceding in the spirit groaning and travailing bringing forth a release of a person or a place or a city or a country or a government from Satan's hold in the spirit the works of Satan will be destroyed and God will bring forth his purposes and his word bringing forth what he plans in the name of Jesus. I have authority. I'm taking my rightful place as a royal priest. I'm going to begin to pray with my understanding, in authority, binding, loosing, casting down, destroying these works, remitting the sins, specifically putting my authority into operation to effectively deal with what must be dealt with in the spirit as well as praying in tongues as I must so the Holy Spirit will flow forth to accomplish everything else to bring forth the will of God as I do this I thank you Lord you're gonna bring forth your perfect will we're gonna be perfect and complete in all the will of God. We're going to destroy the works of the enemy. We're going to plug up the gaps. We're going to see your restoration. We're going to make up the hedge. We're going to be able to stand victorious. We're going to stop the works of the enemy. We're going to stop these devils from working in this nation and against us in our life. We have dominion and we're going to arise and begin to use that dominion and destroy the enemy's works. Thank you. We will engage in warfare intercessory prayer and allow you to operate through us. Your vessels for your vengeance to repay these enemies, fury to the enemies, and to destroy their works. Thank you, Lord. You're going to use me mightily as I engage in warfare intercessory prayer. 
in Jesus' name.